Okay, we're recording, Kathy. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. It is this is the May 21st meeting of the Finance Committee. Meeting Bob Hegner, our chair, is unable to be here. Join us with us today. He has a family event taking him away from it. So he's asked me to chair. I'm Kathy Shane, the vice chair. So my first order of business to open the meeting is to make sure the committee members who are here can hear and be heard. Mm -hmm. And then we have a series of uh, departments that we'll be talking to. So I'll just call out names in the order I see them on the screen. Andy? I'm here. Mandy? Present. Matt? Here. And uh, Alicia is here. Alicia. Uh, when she connects. Alicia, can you hear us? I'm just making sure everyone is here and can be heard. Yes, thank you, Kathy. So we're missing, um, we have two people absent and the rest of us are here as a quorum. So I believe first up on the list and Athena can correct me is public health. And so we're, we're in, you've been sent some questions and we may be asking you a few more questions. Um, so. Welcome, Kiko. Mandy, go ahead. I'm sorry, we have public comment first, Kathy. We do you want to just let people in the audience know if we're going to do that first or yeah, at I'm, the end? I'm, I'm not looking at the agenda. And the school building committee always does it at the end. So thank you for reminding me. So what up to you if, when, when you, you want to take it up? If anyone in the audience has questions, let's do public comments first since we um, are we have plenty of time today. And I'm not seeing any hands go up. Okay, there are no public comments. So thank you for keeping me to the agenda as we wrote it. Kiko, welcome. And thank you. Kiko is director of our public health department. Hi everyone, good afternoon, happy to be here. Um, and thanks for your questions. I don't know if you want me just to dive in and answer the questions that were sent ahead of time or, yes? If there's I, anything I, you wanna say about about your department or budget to, to begin with. You can say a word or two and then yeah, we'll, we'll get to the question. Sure, okay. Hey. Um, so I have been the public health director now since October. So just about seven months or so. So um, this is my first budget meeting and my first go around with the budget book. Um, and I am really happy to be here, excited to be thinking about what public health looks like in the post-COVID era. That was something that I alluded to and something that you had a question about. So happy to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I, I just, <laughs> full disclosure, I came from a big county health department in California that had a very large budget. And so this is very interesting for me to be working in a much smaller setting with a smaller budget. But um very excited about the work that we have here and um, happy that some of the requests that we made were able to be granted given the tight. I know the town really has a tight budget. So, you know, we're soldiering on with our small team, small but mighty, and um, doing some good work. So I'm happy to have the opportunity to answer the questions that you sent ahead and have a bit of a discussion about public health in Amherst. So, um, well, and, and we're glad to have you here. So I, um, I think two other people, I think Mandy and Matt just, and so I don't know which sent in questions. So if you go through some of the questions that were asked, I have some and they may or may not have been asked in advance. Okay, great. So I'll start with the list that I have. Athena gave me um, five questions, I think. And Athena feels free to sort of jump in and guide me if, as I said, this is my first time. So if I'm missing the mark or there's something else you need to hear, please tell me. Um, so there was a question about staffing. Um, and in the org chart, there are really two people only in the org chart, which is the health director, my job, which is 1.0 FTE. And then the public health nurse, which is Olivia Lara Cahoon. She's been in the job for almost two years. It'll be two years this summer. And she's at 0 0.8 FTE. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we did have some ARPA funds that allowed her to work at 1.0. But really, she's happier at 0 0.8. It works better with her family schedule. She and I had some discussions about that when I first started the job. And so she's gone back to a 0 0.8. And that, that better meets her needs. And it does meet the needs of the department. So that's working well. So there was a question about that. Like, what is your actual FTE? And on that budget, it's really just 1.8 FTE. We do have two additional staff that have been working with us. Um, one of them is Nancy Schroeder. She's paid for through 
extra help. So there's $20,000 that's put into the budget to cover her salary. Um, she's someone who probably well know her. She's very well known to people in the town. She used to work for the housing authority. Is kind of our repository of historical knowledge for the health department. The person I go to who has an answer to every question I have. Um, and she works just 12 hours a week. Um, and that's work. She does the minutes for the board of health meetings and is really, really helpful to have. So we're thankful that that $20,000 in extra help was also built into our budget for fiscal year 25. And then the other position that we have is our public health, what we call our public health program assistant. So Nancy is really an administrative sort of office manager kind of role. Our public health program assistant was brought on during COVID when we really needed someone to coordinate the mass vaccine clinics and all of the other work that sort of flowed from the COVID pandemic. His name is Kyle O'Connor. He's a graduate student. Well, he just graduated last Friday with his master's in public health from UMass Amherst and has been with us for 18 months and plans to stay on through the summer. He's looking for full-time work closer to his home in Worcester. So probably won't be us, with us forever, but he plays a really critical role. So obviously during COVID, it was very important to have someone come in to help with this massive amount of work that the public health department was suddenly saddled with. Um, but there are many other things that he's still working on and that we need someone for managing all of the phone calls that come into the health department, um, updating our website, continuing to organize vaccine clinics. We're very much in a place now where we want to be able to prevent future pandemics. And so much of that is about keeping people healthy with what we know is out there now. And that's making sure that people get vaccinated and provide the climate where people feel like they can trust a health department or other places to come and get vaccinated. And having a staff person who can do that kind of work is super critical. So that's what he's been working on. And what I understand is that although we requested funds for him um, part-time, he's uh, funded, he's a part-time person funded through ARPA till the end of December. Again, he may not be here, but that position is still critical even if he's not here. And that those funds were not built into the budget, that additional request that we made to sustain that part-time program assistant. So I'll stop there um, and see if you have any questions to the answer to the question that I provided. Um, you know, I'll, I'll look to others first and then I'll call on myself. Mandy. Yeah, you partially answered. I, I had sort of a related question about that org chart, which is there's the org chart that seemed to indicate 1.8 FTE, but then later on, like the next page, it had FTE staffing that said 2.0 FTE. And so from a 1.8 to a 2.0, and I'm curious what that 0.2 FTE symbolizes or pays for, what, what that is. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that question, Mandy, and I was trying to figure out where that reference was to the 2.0 FTE. I'm just missing it. I don't see that. It's on page 182. 182. I, I saw the same thing, Mandy. So 182, and I thought maybe the 1.8 person had gone to full time. Ah, I see. Got it. Okay. Yeah. It's in, it's in the board. I didn't notice that. Yes. Okay. I think that I think that is um Again, I think there was, it seems like, I'm new here, oh, getting to know the process. There might have been, oh, Holly, please chime Holly. in. <laughs> Holly, Holly, chime in. Okay, if I may. So the positions were both full-time positions, um, both one full FTE. 20% of the position was being paid through, being paid for with ARPA funds. With ARPA going away in December, we added the other 20% back to the nurse position um, simply because she has chosen to reduce her hours, but she could also choose to bring them back to full time at some point. And we wanted to make sure that that would be covered if she chose to go back to full time or if she were to leave and somebody else was to come on. It is a full time, you know. 75 hour um, a pay period position. So we budgeted them both as full-time positions with the understanding that currently she is only working 80% um, instead of 100%. That additional money will be used to cover Kyle's position if she does not go back to full-time. So it, it was budgeted at the 100% instead of the 80%. When ARPA went away, we wanted to make sure it was covered if she chose to increase her hours or if we chose to keep Kyle. So it's sort of a, a little bit of a multi-purpose at this point in time, if that makes sense. 
Thank you, Holly. Thanks, Holly. It, it, and it's so you'll know, as I understood what, what was just said about Kyle, both he and the money for him go away by the end of this year. So that's the point at which you'll know whether you're hiring a an eight month or nine month, whatever that number. Right. If, if we hire another person to replace him, we would have the funds available from the additional 20% of um, the nursing position. Okay. Right. Matt, is it, uh, I think, Mandy, that answered that question. Yes. Yeah. So, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. And th thanks, Kiko. That was a great explanation and welcome um, to finance. <laughs> uh, it, it is on, uh, so I, I submitted those first couple questions and it is on page 43 explaining that point too, but Holly and Kiko, your responses gave great sort of color commentary there. So sounds like a smart, um, smart approach. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And thanks Holly for the help. That was really important. <laughs> um, so those were the main, I think those were the two main questions about the staffing and the salary. So I feel like we covered those so we can move on. There was a question about the Sharps disposal program and whether Pelham and Sheetsbury helped to pay for the regional Sharps collection. So um, the program is actually offered to Leverett as well. I, I realized that, that we have, it's not explicit in our you know, promotional material that Leverett is also part of the program. And that just mirrors what the, the Amherst Regional School District, that those are the four communities that make up that region. Um, this The program is entirely funded through people paying for when they come in with a sharp drop off, they pay us to drop it off for disposal and, and get another container. So it's $5 for a small container and $10 for a bigger container. And that's how we sustain the program. So there aren't any town funds that go into the program. It's a pay for kind of program. Um, you know, obviously we pay for our staff time to administer it. It's not a huge burden, um, but that's how that program works. Does that answer the question about the Sharps program? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the um, next question. Oh, go ahead. Kiko, if you just wait a second, I see Matt's hand is up. So I'm going to, when these little yellow hands go up, I try to call sure. on them. <laughs> I think she's going on to my question now, Kathy. Thank you. I'll, I'll okay. hold on. Okay. okay. Thanks. So uh, the question about the doubling of infectious disease case investigations, is that the next question? No. No. And Kiko, you can you can jump back to this if you want to. I was going to ask you, I had asked you about the, um, there's an objective to evaluate staffing needs post COVID-19 and create a workforce to meet the needs of the town. And just because I, I mean, I haven't been involved. I got involved with this work, you know, sort of mid to late pandemic on finance. So I don't really know what our health department looks like when we're not in the midst of a global epidemic, but or pandemic. But I, my thought is that you know, there's different staffing needs when 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 you are or are not facing a pandemic. Right. Yeah. No, I'm glad that you asked that question. I do have some thoughts about it. So I'll get to that one because it's a little meatier in a second. But let me just answer this other one, which I'm really glad that you all asked. So there was a please explain the near doubling of infectious disease and case investigations. And we went back and looked at it. So um, over the years, um, so these are communicable diseases, not including COVID and not including tuberculosis. We calculate them separately. Um, and they there was a real decrease in fiscal year 21. And that was because it was the heart of the pandemic and people were only focused on COVID and not doing so much other infectious disease tracking. And then it came back up again, but then it looked like it doubled to 247 from 108 in fiscal year 23. So. Uh, again, since I'm new here and Olivia hadn't prepared the numbers, she, I guess, had not prepared the numbers for this budget book last year. Jen must have done it. She used a different methodology. She included not only confirmed cases, but also probable and suspect cases. So if you take out the probable and suspect cases, the number should actually be 123, which is a slight increase. And we did hear from Mass DPH that there was sort of a slight increase in other infectious diseases because people were kind of getting tested again, more attention was being paid to the public health infrastructure that sort of, or the public health activities that went by the wayside during COVID. So we expected to see a slight increase, but not a doubling. So that's a methodology error. And I think it's probably too late to change it in the budget book, but we can certainly asterisk it and explain it in next year's um, iteration of the book. So that's the story there. Thank you for drawing attention to that. 
And uh, if there aren't any other questions about that, then I'll go on to this last question I have that Matt just raised again. So I think it's really, um, it's been so interesting, somebody who's been in public health for a lot of years to see what happened during the pandemic. You know, when public health does its job well, we're invisible. Nobody really knows that things are, you know, what we're doing because we're keeping people healthy through all these infrastructure things like restaurant inspections and vaccines and whatnot. And then when you have a pandemic come along, suddenly public health is thrust into the limelight. And I feel like there were a lot of people who understood the importance of public health in a different way during COVID. And there were a lot of people also who weren't so happy about what public health decided to do to keep people healthy, which seemed like an infringement of civil liberties to some people during COVID. But nevertheless, I think now that we're out of COVID and we're not in crisis, um, their health, health departments really mushroomed during COVID. This particular health department, again, I wasn't here, I was working in California, but I've seen the records and there were a number of contact tracers and other people who were employed who got jobs during COVID working for the health department to trace the, the cases and contacts of people who had COVID over the two and a half, three years that we were really in the throes of it. Um, and so, it, you know, all health departments kind of expanded in size as to cope with the pandemic, and there was money to support that. And now that COVID is sort of receding into the distance, that money is not available. ARPA funds, which were also, pro you know, provided in response to the COVID pandemic are going away. But I think we all learned the lesson of it's important to have really good infrastructure in place to prevent these kinds of things from happening and to be able to respond in a timely fashion. So it just makes us think about what would the ideal staffing be for a public health department in a relatively, you know, a moderately sized town like Amherst. Um, so I think there really are just two people that are on the books full time um, for the town of Amherst and the other folks that we have are included in the org chart because they're part time or temporary. And compared to health departments in other towns, Amherst Health Department is fairly small given the large population that we have here, especially when the students are in town. And so I think it's really an opportunity for us to think about how we staff ourselves to be able to get ahead of public health problems before they turn into crises. Um, and some of the things that I'm thinking about are um, food insecurity is an issue that's come up quite a bit. Um, we There was a community health needs assessment that was done by some UMass Amherst students and food insecurity was something that came up as a big issue. I actually had the opportunity to work with a couple of program planning students from a master's class uh, at UMass on developing a program plan about how the town could address food insecurity. They did a really nice job. I mean, that's a benefit of being in this community is that students can be really excellent work partners, but they're time limited. They come up with great plans and then they graduate or they go on to a new class. And so you need to have staff that can help to implement those plans. As the director, I have a lot of things that I'm responsible for, everything from mosquitoes to beavers to ticks to, to you know, vaccination clinics to nuisance complaints. It's a lot. And so being able to really address a public health problem in depth requires additional staffing. And with, through this needs assessment, we have some ideas of some of the things that we'd want to look at more closely in order to really elevate community health in Amherst, but we need people to do that work. Um, I mentioned the opioid, settle, opioid crisis. I think it's also decreasing somewhat. There are good statistics about how the number of overdoses are less in the region. Amherst has never had very high numbers, but it is a concern in the community. Um, we do have opioid settlement funds that could potentially pay for a part-time person in addition to other things like harm reduction supplies. So being able to have a person really mount some sort of a comprehensive um, response to substance use requires a staff person. It's not something that would be easy for me to do with all of my other responsibilities. Um, I think I mentioned vaccination. You know, it's one thing to hold a clinic, but if you really want to have high vaccination rates, and we don't have them in Amherst, um, only 25% of people in the town of Amherst got the most recent COVID booster. And given long COVID and other things, the best protection against variants, long COVID, severe COVID infection is good vaccination in a community so that you have herd immunity. And that requires people talking to people, building trust, getting out there, doing work, community outreach. That's not something that we're currently posed, poised to do with the staff that we have. So these are the kinds of things that I've been thinking about. I did submit an application to the CDC for a program called the Public Health Associate Program, where they will assign a newly graduated public health professional to work for two years in a public health department, um, fully paid by CDC. And I'm hopeful that we will get somebody assigned to us and that that person could be paid, you know, work with us to expand our staffing, um, which would be wonderful, but again, would only be for two years. So that would be it, but it's an opportunity for us to think about what a more broadly staffed health department can do, what kind of impact it can make 
in the community. So I see some hands up. I'm going to stop talking. Um, but first, let me ask you, Matt, if I if before others go, if if that answers your question or if you have other nuances I didn't cover. Yeah, thank you. That no, that, I mean it, it's as somebody new walking in, you know, right right now, it's it's definitely um, probably kind of daunting to see a small small staffing and all of our urgent needs. Um, I guess others will probably ask this too, but I'll just since you since you mentioned it, um, the opioid settlement funds. We are and and Andy may have a better recollection of this, but. I believe that was something that was going to be coordinated through the public schools um, on some prevention projects. Uh, but if you can speak to that a little bit more, that would be that would be helpful. Yeah, I can speak to that now, or I can take questions, whichever you prefer, Kathy. But well, just continue on that one, Kiko. Okay. Away. Yeah. So in terms of the opioid settlement funds, um, I don't know what kinds of conversations were had before I came on. Um, when I came on, there was some administrative stuff that had to be done. So the monies were just starting to flow into the town right as about the time that I came on board. And so some paperwork needed to be filed to say, yes, we have this money. We actually haven't spent it yet. Um, here's what we're planning to do. And like many other towns in the region, we've been involved with some needs assessment that Hampshire Hope, which is the regional opioid task force has been coordinating, sending out surveys, holding focus groups, hearing from people most impacted by the opioid crisis. So people who use drugs, people in recovery, the families of people who use drugs or who are in recovery, we wanna hear those voices. And that's actually been not mandated because the state can't mandate it, but firmly requested or suggested that we do this. And so we're in this process of hearing from communities before we come up with a comprehensive plan to spend the funds. I don't know what kinds of conversations were had with the schools. I think upstream efforts, like talking with young people about mental health, because we know that you know if you're struggling with mental health, that might be something that propels you to use substances in a not functional way. So there's a lot of upstream work that we could do with young people in the schools that certainly could be paid for through the opioid settlement funds. We just haven't begun. I haven't at least started to have those conversations in much detail yet. So I, in the order I saw Mandy, then Andy, um, in terms of hand, other hands up. Thank you. Um, that was a, a fascinating explanation of public health as a whole, because I know myself, I, I don't, a lot of what you mentioned, I don't necessarily think of as part of our public health department versus other departments, um, which which goes to a couple of the things you were talking about and, and my questions. The first one is um, how much of the work you do is coordinatable or duplicated or potentially duplicative of work other departments do or programs other departments have, like senior services or inspection services are some of the ones I think about the most that might might be there um and if so how do we make sure we're not necessarily duplicating efforts versus um complementing efforts and increasing sort of um availability of of services because of those complementary efforts and then to go along with that and the question that originally popped into my mind when you said we don't have as big of a department as many other cities our size have um how much of that is potentially uh, a result of half of our population being housed on a university campus with a department amongst themselves that is maybe not formally public health, but it serves that population in a manner that might be similar to a public health department? And how much coordination do you do with in UMass's health services and and does that then relieve some of the work that would normally be expected out of a, a municipal public health service type thing in terms of are we really sort of functioning with a slightly larger department than it looks like on paper because of services UMass provides to its students and, and staff and faculty? I know during COVID there was a lot provided to them directly, not through our town. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I think that there is probably something to the fact that the population of Amherst sort of decreases by half when the students aren't here and that the students do have their own health system. For, if we take the case of infectious diseases, there's a reporting system called MAVEN for the whole Commonwealth. So whenever there's an infectious disease, whether it's norovirus, salmonella, TB, it gets entered in MAVEN and it comes to the health department. So any cases that are in a UMass student or faculty, UMass is going to follow up. So that's it's not un, it's not uncommon that we see cases and we think oh we don't have to follow up on those they'll do it at UMass we do there are still other cases that we have to follow up on if they're in Amherst but that definitely you know if we had us if we didn't have UMass we would certainly need a public health another public health nurse to follow up on those cases in Northampton they have four public health nurses two of them are Northampton nurses and two of them are regional nurses through the public health excellence grant um, but you know, I think we're okay from a public health nursing standpoint because they're, we're not taxed for those ID infectious disease investigations since UMass can do them. But there are other kinds of things, sort of broader community-based kinds of things that we don't have the bandwidth to, to do to look at. Um, because there are so many things that, that a local board of health or health director is responsible for, um, you know, coordinating the animal inspector, um, all the mosquito and tick-borne diseases I mentioned, you know, so many different things that are required for a board of health to manage that there isn't time to really dive deeper into more of those other issues that could really bring things just make public health better for people so i think that there's a little bit of yes umass can cover some things and still if i think about northampton they have uh i think 15 staff that are public health staff um, I might not be remembering the numbers completely, but there's they're doing a lot of really interesting things. Um, they have a lot of substance use programs with maybe four or five staff there because they've made the commitment to apply for grants to support that kind of work so they can really dive into depth on a particular public health issue. And we're not really well poised to do that in Amherst. Um, but to the other point that you raised about complementary versus duplicating services, one of the great advantages of being here in the Bank Center is that we are all very collaborative. So I work with Haley really closely. We just wrote a grant together to do a series of wellness um, Wednesdays for, for seniors in the Senior Center. Um, so we're sort of leveraging our internal resources, our staff time, but also trying to get some money to sort of support educational materials, food, other things that make a program like that run well. Um, so we work, we don't duplicate services. We work well together. If we get some, if we get a call from someone that's really an elder issue, we refer it to the senior center. The same is true for Crest. A big part of public health, something that I think is very important, is recognizing the impact of social determinants of health. You know, adequate housing, access to food, freedom from violence and discrimination. Those are all things that support people's health. We certainly aren't resourced to provide those kinds of things, but if we get a call from someone and we hear about something, we work really closely with Crest to help that family or help that person address some of these issues that are sort of social in nature, but that are having an impact on their health. So I would say it's very much complementary and not duplicative in the way that we all are working here together. Um, Crest has been a great partner. And the last thing I just wanted to mention is that I think we, we could have more staff. We need more staff to do more, but we also have some existing resources, which are great. I mentioned CRESS. Um, I mentioned the community health needs assessment that we have. And there's also the public health excellence grant, which I did mention as well, which is um, Northampton Department of Health and Human Services runs that. And that they have regional staff who can help with certain things like vaccine clinics, like other technical assistance that we might not be well poised to do. So it's a it's a, a great sort of jumping off point for to, pro, to better resource some of the things that we would like to do. It doesn't do everything, but it helps us to do some things that we're not able to do with our limited staff. Thank you. Andy. Uh, well, first of all, Kiko, welcome to Amherst. And uh, I need to give you a call on other matters at some point in the next few days. But uh, in any event, it, it's great to get to know you for first of this meeting. Uh, I have uh, uh, have have a long-term association with the uh, public health work we've been doing in town. And one of the things that you just mentioned that I, just, I wanted to just bring up is that uh, you, you mentioned Crest and you mentioned the size of the department, uh, the people working in public health in Northampton. And to remember that the Crest program equivalent in Northampton is a public health program, not a public safety program. 
and that that was the big difference in models between what uh, we did when we were setting up an additional uh, program um, and uh, to what Northampton decided to do. Uh, Alicia, who's on the call as a member of the committee, was chair of the Community Safety Working Group, and they very strongly recommended that uh, as we make the effort, we make it a public safety department. So that is, that's the history there. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, and my other comment, and, and then I have a question, but the other comment is, is that yeah, uh, the university has substantial resources uh, to address problems that arise within the uh, campus community. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't been able to establish a wall that keeps air flowing from flowing between the rest of the town and the campus so that there is the potential of crossover problems. And uh, it's the way we just have to deal with things. The um, question that I had was that you mentioned in the significant changes section of the uh, book when it was talking about, uh, there was mention of the West Nile virus habitat treatment funds. And uh, so I was wondering um, about that as to whether that's part of the Mosquito Control District. And uh, then the other questions that go with it is uh, whether that is continuing funding or one-time funding, a sense of the amount and the description of what uh, we're doing with those funds. Yeah, it is part of the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. So we have, we pay dues. It's a $5,000 dues that we pay to PVMCD that Jen Brown made happen when she was here. So we are part of that. That means that they do this very intensive surveillance of our community, which they hadn't been doing prior to us being a member of the district. So um, as a result of that surveillance that was done last year, they did find at the end of the season a West Nile positive mosquito in a pool in North Amherst. So there were no cases of West Nile in humans, but there was a mosquito that was tested positive for West Nile. So that indicated that that was an area they wanted to target for early larval um, larvicide in the season. So next month, um, they will do, they will treat that positive pool with a larvicide, um, which is much more effective than killing adult mosquitoes. You want to try to try to kill the larvae early on. So that's the additional charge. The $3,000 is for this briquette treatment at a couple of different times in this area over the, se over the summer season. Um, and that would be a recurring fee. If it turns out that we have a lot of West Nile positive mosquito activity, we might want to consider doing this briquette treatment again next year, in which case we would have to make an additional budget request for that amount of money. Again, it's for a couple of treatments in a fairly wide area. Um, and I have a lot of confidence in the PVMCD. The person who runs it is excellent, very hardworking, and does a really great job with surveillance and treatment. So that's what that is all about. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for the question. So I have one more, but I see we're 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 hitting the end of our allocated time. So this is for a future question. You don't have to answer it. Um, and we have see the senior center up later today. Um, one of the things I've seen in other communities, I have a background on health policy where we're looking at systems approaches, is some um, home visits by often visiting health nurses or nurses to do a safety assessment of the person's home, particularly for elderly. Um, and things like scatter rugs that you could trip off of. Um, the other thing uh, that one very innovative place did is open the drug ca cabinet door and take a picture of the meds and send them back to the doctor to ask mm -hmm. them if they knew what the person was taking because people were doctor hopping and getting scripts and they were getting drug drug interactions. So between the senior center and the school, public health, if there was a grant program to support that kind of community outreach, um, it's sort of thinking of where might the person sit? And you also, the other thing that's in Bangs is a health clinic, is the health, Musanti Health Center. You know, just thinking of, 
a different kind of not but it's it's also prevent this is all preventive it's not a service delivery so it, it's it, that you talked about the opioid you know training people and doing early kinds of things so i think you it's it's for future because you're a tiny department i don't think you can do that with the department and i was glad to see you were using the school of public health we do have a very good nursing school at Amherst in umass too and to the extent they've got internships in community health mm -hmm. uh, might be able to link up even though they'd be one year at a time so it, it's a a potential way to expand without spending more town money is is what i so so th yeah. those thanks yeah. for that idea i'll just say i used to run a lot of home visiting programs so i'm very familiar with that model and uh haley and i will definitely talk about that idea so thank you thank you so if, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to say a big welcome both to this meeting, but to the town of Amherst. We we need, it's actually I think it's healthy that you're coming from a really big place to a smaller place to say, what are we missing? But what also can we do differently? Because we can, we don't have a lot of, you do it this way versus that way. You can be creative. So thank you very much. So Athena, who... Next. Who do we have up next? Um, Kiko, we won't come back to public health, so you are. Thank you. I'll log off. You're you, you're all, you're welcome to stay and listen if you like, but I'm sure you have lots of other things that you'd like to get to. And so next we have Haley from the senior senior center, and then um, at three o'clock we'll move to recreation. That's great. Okay. Um, awesome. So I don't have a lot to say before I get into the questions. You know, I think the senior center budget is pretty small. It's 98% salary and 2% operating expenses. Um, I always like to thank the town for its increased support. You know, we did get a couple increases this year for which I'm very grateful. And I also like to thank the friends of the Amherst Senior Center because without them, um, that in grant writing, of course, we wouldn't be able to offer any program services or um, things of that nature. So unless there are other questions, I'll dive right in. The easiest question to answer is the 2.4 um, FTE increase. So currently our silver, shutter, silver shuttle driver is paid for through ARPA. Once that ends, um, that increase will be the town kicking in the rest of the salary to continue that position. Um, and then would I speak to the accomplished programming and services review? So this was really a quantitative analysis of the programs that we do. So we had some of the COA go through and identify, you know, what types of programs are we offering, um, offering you know, dates and times, looking at categories of programs. Um, the most well-attended things here at the Senior Center, exercise, meals, and socialization. I also have, over the course of the last couple of years, seen a big increase in the need for social services. Um, you know, I think at an earlier finance committee meeting, it was mentioned that older adults want to age in place. That's absolutely true. It's very true in Amherst, um, and that's very expensive to do. So um, older adults are needing a lot more help and support around that. Um, in terms of trying to meet some of those needs, particularly with exercise and meal, that's difficult given our physical space. Um, there's some challenges with that. Um, but as a department, we've made it a goal for 2024 to onboard more programming, social services. So we are doing a mobile dental clinic. We have a suicide um, loss support group. We're doing a Wednesday market that offers um, produce, vegetables, baked goods um, to, to anyone in the community who's food insecure. Um, and then again, just the, the space and the finance um, component makes it hard to, to meet all the needs that people have identified. And on that note, um, someone had asked about progress on our ability to prepare meals. I can say that unfortunately there has not been any as long as the kitchen is in the state that it's in. The health inspector has been really clear that we can brew coffee and that's all. Um, I hope that someday when that space is able to be renovated, that we can really expand what we're doing, um, particularly given that we've established this relationship with Whole Foods where we get a couple hundred pounds of food donated every week. It would be really nice to set some of that aside and to do a healthy meals program for older adults. Um, but as of right now, there's uh, there's been no change on that front. Um, 
Funds for the Silver Shuttle are currently paid for by ARPA. Is there capacity within the current budget to fulfill that um, and to meet the objective of increasing ridership? You know, again, we're looking at salary and operating expenses. So within the town allocated budget, I would say no. Um, but I have been working with PVTA on a grant application, which we have successfully uh, achieved, and that will allow us to hire a second part-time driver. We'll be able to offer five days a week ridership. And once we are able to do that, we'll meet that 15% target. So um, really big thanks to PVTA for helping to make that possible. And I know I'm going kind of fast, so if people have questions, you can just raise your hand. Um, let's see. There are a lot of really great questions. Um, I think there was a question regarding multiple departments, um, you know, planning events and activities, combining resources. Um, you know, again, it's hard to combine resources. I think, um, like Kiko said, certainly staff time is something that we combine resources on, like for this grant that we're applying for, um, you know, identifying how we can promote public health awareness um, among older adults and foster social relationships. Um, but given the fact that most of our program money comes from grants and donations, it's not totally feasible. Um, you know, if, if a grant says that it's specifically for this project, I couldn't share that with another department. And if someone's donating to the senior center, I couldn't take that and, and you know, share it with another department. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, and otherwise, I can say that we're very collaborative. Um, I partner a lot with our public safety offices. About a third of all 911 calls in Amherst are for older adults. So it's really important to me that we, we focus a lot of attention there. But we also work with REC. You know, if, if I don't have the capacity to offer an adult program, REC will often, um, you know, help support that effort. Obviously, public health um, We've been working with the elementary schools, doing intergenerational programming. Um, Matt Barry from the library does drop-in tech assistance. We have a library book club. Um, I've even had the assessor come and explain property tax abatement. So definitely trying not to duplicate, but definitely trying to make sure that people know that the town is very much interconnected and that there's a lot of resources out there for them. Um, and then there was a, another part to that question about recreation charging fees and senior center not. So, you know, I can't speak for recreation, but I can say that there are a great deal of low income older adults who use the senior center. And so to charge fees would be really prohibitive um, for them to access our programs. Um, some things have a fee, but most things are a suggested donation. You know, we do say to folks, donations make it possible for us to do programs and services. So not ever a requirement, but if you are able to contribute, it's appreciated. Um, and then some of the grants that we hold specifically for our memory cafe state very clearly that we cannot charge fees for that. So sometimes it's part of a grant requirement. Um, and I think, I think that was all of your questions. You did pretty good on timing. Does anyone who submitted the questions have any expansion on what Haley very efficiently addressed? Because I have a few that weren't on the list. Um, and I know it was mainly Mandy and me. Mandy. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the sort of combining services mm -hmm. working with rec question um, as I try and figure out you know, and learn more about how y'all work together and all. Mm -hmm. And and I was the one that asked the question that sometimes rec charges fees is they don't always charge fees and, and senior mm -hmm. services doesn't. When you go to rec and say, you know, we don't have the capacity or operating expenses to be able to offer mm -hmm. X program because we haven't received the donations for it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, but we've got a really great idea. Um, if rec decides to offer it, do they limit it to seniors and up because many rec programs, once you hit adult, are not limited to seniors and up. Like, or you know, how how does some of that work? Not necessarily charging fees, but mm -hmm. if you've got an idea, but you can't offer it within the senior services center, and you're able to work with rec so that they offer it, is there still a limit as to who can participate? As far as I know, no. Um, if Ray were here, I would double check with him. 
He'll be here um, next. And, so I'll ask oh, good, him. Okay. <laughs> good. Um, and then I think the other thing too, is a lot of older adults like intergenerational and even if that's intergenerational people in their, you know, thirties, forties, fifties. Um, so I, I think it's always good to have that kind of dynamic. So I'll add mine. I'm looking at the trends charts. Mm -hmm. It looks like you're, you have a, a lot fewer volunteers and volunteer mm -hmm. hours than you used to have. Um, my, my mother is one of the people you don't have anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, she did Meals on Wheels and a variety oh, of- Oh, awesome. Yeah, so, so it's just, to what extent do, um, outside of the town services, Amherst Neighbors has started doing a lot of volunteer work mm -hmm. with, including just go and read a story with people, go play chess, you know, so to homebound lonely. Do you, to what extent does some of that um, make up for the fact that you don't have an act or is that pulling away people that used to volunteer for the senior mm -hmm. center? So just some oh. judgment on what <clears throat> And in the same uh, the same way I would just do on the meals, the things mm -hmm. that are down, Survival Center is doing some things that mm -hmm. they didn't used to do. Um, and there's home meal delivery that used to be run out of the senior center. Mm -hmm. So are there outside resources for seniors that are starting to complement what you can offer? Um, I think there are definitely a lot more options. And I think today's Today senior is very savvy and there are and Amherst in particular has a lot of resources um, at people's disposal. And there is still that stigma of accessing a senior center. You know, if someone in their 90s is telling me I'm too young for the senior center, you know, there, there's some attitudes that we're hoping we can change. Um, volunteer hours, you know, a lot of folks have been volunteering um, since Nancy Pagano was here. And so maybe now they're a little bit older or, you know, unfortunately we had a volunteer who had to step back and she, she actually passed very recently. So there, there's those kind of changes that happen, um, particularly more with older adults than, than in some other volunteer areas. Uh, we also had a situation, you know, over the summer um, that kind of inhibited our ability to recruit volunteers because we were, we were so short staffed that people were kind of pulled all over the place. And so the progress we had hoped to make last year had, you know, didn't materialize and some of that carries forward. Um, and then you had asked about, you know, the meals. Again, there's a lot of options. I would say in terms of home delivered meals, you know, we're very much one of the few games in town for that. Um, and that's all provided through Highland Valley Elder Services. Um, we do get some good foot traffic, um, maybe about 20, 25 people a day for our grab and go meals. But again, people have a lot of options. We do tend to see folks that are, you know, more on the, the low income side participating in those programs. And I think that, you know, that that definitely, um, it just kind of shows you that for other people, there, there are other options that they would rather um, go to. And the other thing is too, without the kitchen being set up is we can't do congregate meals. So right now we're all doing grab and go. So maybe if we were able to offer in-person dining, we would get more attendance. So there's a lot of variables and I, I wish I had a firmer question for you, but there's there's certain factors I don't have control over that we're slowly working to address. So I'm hoping that by the time I'm sitting here next year, we'll, we'll see some improvement. So I, you know, I can certainly understand and, and I won't ask you to go into the detail of what, what's going on with the kitchen, but I'm, I'm one of the people that uh, I do see the envelope come into the Friends mm -hmm. of the Senior Center and to, to what there's potentially, if there are certain equipment and things that need to be replaced that are too expensive, there might be a way of uh, appealing to people to mm -hmm that but i it's part of this larger what's going to happen to get banks question yep. probably yeah for the kitchen yep. yeah so i don't think i have anything else i just thought the some of the trends on these numbers were really uh striking if especially if you had used senior centers before you used to do a foot clinic and you do ver various kinds of an ear mm -hmm. clinic to take the earwax mm -hmm. out and, and it was and for the fee question mandy some of them had no fee but a suggested fee um and, and and it was interactive with applewood and some of the other places in terms of vans coming over so 
Yeah. So if we do offer the foot clinic still, we actually did expand that to one and a half days a month because it's one of the most requested services. Um, and I, I did want to add something about the kitchen just because I think sometimes it's really amorphous, like the kitchen. But there are things like, you know, we need a hand washing sink. Um, you know, there, there's new cabinetry that would need to be installed in order to be like food safe. Um, so it's those kind of things, just so that it's not this like amorphous, what could we do? It's, it's that kind of stuff. No ventilation. Andy. Yeah, hi. Um, I have uh, actually just one fairly simple question. I don't know if uh, she or Athena or Holly can answer it, but I was curious on page 186 under major components mm -hmm. uh, in that box, it says state funding offsets $40,000. Yeah. And I was wondering what that meant. Yeah, so every year um, we are allocated a formula fund and that is based on our census number of older adults. And we are really hoping that the governor will increase um, that per elder amount to $15 in which would mean more money for the senior center. Um, but that's where that 40,000 comes from. So that's from the state determining how many elders live in Amherst and then giving us um, a dollar amount based on that number. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, um, and then again, this may be a Holly or Athena question. I'm not going to put pressure on you, but is it mm -hmm. uh, money that is uh, uh, on the cherry sheet? Does it count as state aid? Where do we counted on revenue? That I couldn't answer. Um, that might be a better Holly question. Actually a state grant from, I believe. Holly, can you just um, make sure you're, there yeah, you go. I'm sorry. Thanks. It's actually a state grant. I believe it comes from the Department of Elder Affairs. Mm -hmm. And um, it is an annual grant, so it's under the state grant section, um, not through the cherry sheet, not through state aid. It's through a grant program that we have continually gotten year after year after year, quite some time now. And so just on, on that, Hallie, when we're looking at a budget, as the page Andy was, is the 40000 mm -hmm. embedded in that, you know, so that 40000 uh, is, or is it in addition to that? So I think when we so were the, here. Yep. So the salary portion, the personnel services portion um, has been reduced by $40,000 and it is reallocated into their salaries. Their salaries are reallocated to the grant, basically. So if we did not have that grant, if that grant were to go away, if that grant were not to be awarded in a particular year, we would have to increase our salaries by $40,000. It's an automatic mm -hmm. deduction off of the salary cost for that department. Thank you. And I just want to say it's a huge, it's a huge lifeline. I know that for myself and many other senior centers across the state, having that is so critical to being able to offer a lot of really great programs and services. You know, it's something that you can use for, you know, offering a, a wellness workshop or paying a staff or doing outreach campaigns. Um, so it's, it's, you're so thankful for EOEA for, for getting that money for each and every COA. Holly, is your hand up again, or was that to just answer oh, this? Sorry, no, I'll take That's it That's right, we're, we're willing to have you join us. <laughs> so if, if they do increase it, um, if they do increase it, 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 as I understand what you're saying, it's a very flexible grant when the money comes in, which we're, you are making a decision. So if they do increase it, one would hope it would be a permanent increase because if you change the way you deliver programs with more money, um, we'd want to be able to sustain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes. And if it and just if it were to increase or when it does increase, we we may look at that allocation again of 40,000 going to salaries and uh, the difference going to other programming costs and supplies. Mm -hmm. You know, we may change that ratio. We may not. It, it sort of all depends on what the increase is and and uh, what we what we decide mm -hmm. to do with that. It'll be a conversation. Yep. So I'm not seeing any other 
hands up right now. So I think we can thank you and okay. cer and certainly thank you for what you do. It's it's a it's a beloved service by a lot of people. Um, and the number of letters the council got on a we want a better senior center. It was. Mm -hmm. They came out with placards. So <laughs> yes. there, there, there's there's a cheering group out there that spans spans a, a large a large group of diver, a very diverse group across mm -hmm. town. So it was great to see that. So thank you. Oh yeah, of course. Thank you. And I'm glad so glad for our supporters. So Athena. Uh, Marion is here from the rec department. Marion, can you hear us? Hi, Athena. Yes, I'm here. And Maria is ready to join as well. Um, just wasn't sure at what point we should hop on. So if we're ready now. You're right on time. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, oh. You're muted now, Marion. Sorry, I'm, oh, that's I'm okay. yelling across the room to Ray. <laughs> I didn't want you to have okay. to hear that. <laughs> All right. All right, he should be hopping on there in a minute. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being with us. And you should have been copied on the questions too. So you have a heads up on. Yes, I have. I have okay, those terrific. questions and I've got some notes. Yeah. Great. Good. Did you want to wait for Ray to join us, Marianne, before we start? Um, I think yes. Um, I'm going to just step away for a second and just see sure. if he's ready to go. Thanks. So Holly, while she's stepping away, can you tell me where I would find the revenue for the golf course? I went back to the back of the book where it showed revenues for various things, but I couldn't find the word golf course. So my question was, are we breaking even on the golf course so I can find expenses, but I can't. And I tried to, you know, in the revolving funds, I think that's where it used to be. And in the recreation part of it, I didn't see the word golf or Cherry Hill. <laughs> So it, it's just a question of where would I find it? I know, I, I think I can see it when you give us the quarterly reports. Um, yes, so um, Cherry Hill used to be an enterprise fund. So it had its own section in the budget book many, many years ago. It is now just part of the, um, the general fund. So it does not have its own section. So the revenues are not shown for each department in the budget book. They would be a part of the um, departmental revenue in like the, the, um, uh, the, the forecast, the five-year forecast in the uh, projection sheet. It, it doesn't break down necessarily in the budget book, the revenues by departments. I don't believe that that's shown, um, but it definitely is part of the quarterly reports and I can run, um, you know, I can run reports on that at any time if you like. I think it would, it would be useful just to have it when we're writing it up because my sense is that it's doing quite well, but um, when I looked, I just went back to the pages that said Re recreation revolving fund. And as I said, Cherry Hill wasn't on the list. So, yeah. no, it's so not I, don't, I don't need it now, but it was a question I thought Ray probably would not not be as able to add, answer as you. So thank you. Welcome. Ray, Ray has joined us. So we are ready to start. Thank you. So what we've been doing is if you want to say a few words of introduction, but otherwise we've jumped into the questions that you were sent in advance, and then uh, people are either asking follow-up questions or questions that weren't weren't originally sent to you. So um, I lead, lead it to you, leave it to you for how you want to begin the conversation. Well, we are, we didn't have any major uh, uh, adjustments, changes in our budget here, 
Um, we have been looking over it. We've been going back and forth with finance a little bit to make a couple corrections on the ones that were presented before, but we are prepared for those questions that you all presented. Then I think if you go through them in whatever order that you would like to go through them, um, we're we're ready. Okay. You want us to go through point by point, each of them? Yep. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I mean, what, whatever is the most efficient. Some some two or three may go together. You know, you don't have to do it in whatever the itemized list was. Do what makes sense to you. Okay. Uh, the questions... I think there were some that had overlaps. I'll try and find where those are to try and keep the themes together. But uh, the first one that we see here is uh, we have a question about tuition support. So subsidy was a was a major point in our conversations and the questions that were asked about us. It was a major point when we sat down with finance and town hall to go over our our budgets uh, a couple of months ago. The uh, um, so are we providing adequate tuition support? Is there an unmet, unmet need? Um, Mary, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, I think we can always improve communication. I think we've increased each year that I've been, well, I guess post-COVID since we've had programs sort of start to get a little bit um bigger again, be able to have more diversity in the classes that we're offering. Um, I think we are seeing a good trend, a little bit more enrollment and therefore a little bit more um, applications for uh, fee subsidy, but I think it can always improve. We're also leaning on outreach a little bit more too, to try to get the communication out in the community that we have fee subsidy available and um, that they can apply really easily and work with our office to get the support they might need. So our, our, uh, our conversation uh, came down, we have the subsidy in a number of different places inside of our uh, the recreation operating budget. We have subsidies that, is, that are built in for our for our after school. Uh, so we, we apply it in a number of different places. Uh, we have left, we have typically left some on the table, but we, Mary and I have been looking at ways to make sure that we're uh, meeting the needs that, that are out there. We're, we, that is a, uh, that's a focus point for us for this upcoming year to make sure that if there are people who need that we're meeting that. And we haven't had a sense that the, the money that we've been, uh, uh, using for subsidy has been has been uh, insufficient. We haven't we haven't had a sense that there have been people who are looking to try and get into our programs that don't have the money. Uh, uh, you know, the, the communicating what those possibilities are is the is the major piece. Um, Two things just to add. Um, one thing is that we don't reject an application if there is a family that looks like they're on the bubble, um, we will offer them a little less help, but we will still um, offer them help. And then the other thing um, to look forward to in the coming um, fiscal year is that because of the ARPA funds that have been um, designated to assist in our efforts to get Amherst youth to learn how to swim, we're now identifying um, a nice handful of people who who we've never met before. So um, so that's good. So we're adding some people to the roster who haven't even either known about our programs or didn't know about fee subsidy. Um, so I think that has helped get a little bit bigger net cast. Um, were there other subsidy questions in here that we can get Matt, to? Matt, Matt do you wanna do a follow-up on this? Or yeah, that was my question, Kathy. Thank you. So, Marion, I think you just answered it for me. Let me just make sure I understand. When you say we don't reject, so you get a subsidy application from somebody who's close to the threshold, and you, you, you never say no outright. There's always some kind of support that can be given. I guess my my question, I think your right. answer is, um, do we have a way of knowing if there are folks who would participate if it weren't for the financial barrier? 
Yeah, I mean, I think also the, you know, we're still in, in with sort of the newly assembled rec team now that we have sort of a full staff again, a full house again. Um, uh, Becky Demling, our outreach director, put out a, a fairly comprehensive survey um, community survey, and she did inquire about what barriers existed for people, um, and maybe why aren't you coming to us, or what could you use to uh, help you participate with us? But um, but yeah, anything anything like that 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 we collect and responses to that, I think um, Becky's going to be compiling that, so we could have that we're, available. I'm not sure when, but we're we we're in the process of finishing that in mm -hmm. the next couple of weeks. Okay. A committee response to the survey. Mm -hmm. Mandy, is this a expansion on the same point? Yeah, um, I'll I'll try to keep it to that point. I had a lot of questions on just funding of of the recreation department in general in terms of fee support and non and taxpayer support that's outside of the fees. But I'm hoping you'll get to that. But as with fee, when you say no application is rejected, um, does that mean if a where resident or a Belchertown resident applies to come to Amherst and participate in an Amherst program, but needs a fee subsidy that they get a fee subsidy or is no, sorry, I should be more only specific. For Amherst we saw, only we Amherst that, residents. Yeah. We saw that question in the, yes. that was submitted here and yeah. our, our subsidies are for Amherst residents. Uh, Although we have in, in previous years, and I don't know how, if it's um, something that we can, maybe probably revisit, but there ha I have seen applications for children who go to our district get support. I haven't seen that well, lately. That means but a Pelhamore, Shootsbury, or a Leverett resident. You got it. Who goes to Amherst Regional Schools. By Correct. Amherst taxpayers, but not Pelham taxpayers. Correct. So I've seen that happen, but it has not happened lately. We have, and I don't, we have yeah. not. We haven't done that in a couple of years here. Yeah. In our in our couple of years working here together. No. Um, the question came up and it's slightly different from the fee subsidy question, but Mary and I were looking at this. The uh, uh, in terms of support for people who are looking for support, some of our agencies that we work with, which include the family center at the schools, that includes the survival center for things like like uh, pool access, like uh, passes to the pools. Um, those agencies, we they aren't applying for those those passes that they get to the pool. Uh, we do some outreach to try and make affordable those those opportunities to get to the to the pools. We share with those different agencies what our uh, we're we're our our access is for Amherst residents, and we 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 want those agencies to be able to to honor that, but we don't ask questions of those agencies that work as sort of uh, agents to help us extend our, our resources. Um, if they were giving to, if, if they were providing access to uh, uh, regional students, for example, to the pools, we wouldn't look to try and remove them. Or if the survival center is providing access to the pools, uh, through our through our support systems, then we wouldn't look to try and try and police that and take that away from them. But they are aware that our that our uh, our resources are Amherst first. Um, the passes um, we can skip to that okay. um, if we want to continue on sort of the um, the path of of fee subsidy and um, and what we charge for versus what we give access to, if that makes sense. Sounds good. Um, so the question was asked for the outdoor pools, um, whether or not it says do free access passes through the schools go only to Amherst residents. And so I only saw about 30 passes go to the school last year. Um, and then we provide to agencies, we've given passes to the survival center, which I know they serve populations beyond Amherst, right? And we've also given pool passes to the housing authority here in Amherst, as well as the senior center. 
So those were the, the free passes that we gave out in the last fiscal year. Um, and yeah, I would say for the last couple of years, that's probably the only access passes I've seen in the way of pool access specifically. Um, and uh, the last thing on uh, for me on that is because it's it's both uh, uh, the the pools are a center of our operations right now. They because they serve such a wide variety of the population because it's a it's a uh, uh, it's a life skill that we are that's part of our mission. We we have made that the center of our expansion uh, of our expansion pushes to try and make sure that. Uh, if nothing else, that that access to lessons, access to the pools is not a, a uh, uh, that that funding is not an issue for those. So that gets into our ARPA push. That gets into what outreach has been doing and our aquatics has been doing to try and extend both in terms of access for money, access for uh, uh, um, uh, ability. Um, uh, we the pools are the center of our outreach right now, and so our expansive programs are are based around that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay. So then the other question that I saw regarding fees and fee structure um, asks: Do the service fees you charge, particularly for programs and activities, cover the cost of the service? If non-residents use the service, do the fees you charge cover? The service, if not, why not? Do we offer scholarships to non-Amherst residents? If so, are those scholarships supported by Amherst tax revenue? I think we sort of were already on that vein. So um, we we set program fees based on the minimum enrollment to break even. So if if and we also have to account for direct costs, like we don't have our own space, and so sometimes we're paying rent, sometimes we're paying custodial fees, um, and so we we build that in. Um, and so if we don't hit the minimum enrollment to run the program, we don't run it. Um, and then non-residents can of course register for programs. And generally speaking, I think other than memberships, um, which would only be for the pools and for Cherry Hill. Um, so excluding memberships, there's about a $10 price difference for um, non-residents if they wanna participate. And then as we established, the fee subsidy is, is only going to Amherst residents. And Marion just hit on uh, one, one of the questions. The one that follows that one here is, seems we have multiple departments that plan events and activities for town residents. Uh, are there ways to make this more efficient or combine resources to expand services? How do we account for recreational generally charging fees for their adult education, recreation options? Uh, we we talked about that and it felt like the discussion was why are our programs charging and other pro, other programs and other departments aren't and i, I want to make sure that it's clear what marion just said is that we don't have space uh we are our our programs are are we set fees based on largely on rent based largely on our access based largely on the the uh, space and the cost that those programs incur for us, and so a lot of our a lot of our sports department, a lot of our a lot of our sports programs, in particular, uh, you know, if they're using the schools on the weekends or the pools are set up to to uh, allow us to pay the bills, um, we don't have our own space. We are operating with we are operating almost entirely on rent. And there are questions there. Mandy. Yeah, I um so some of these were my questions, and hopefully we'll get to total department sort of expenses and what's covered by those fees, because that's what I was trying to tease out on a lot of this is okay. do the fees ac across everything cover recreational departments? But I'm not gonna get into that for now. I, I just wanted to make it clear I actually don't have a problem with recreation charging fees. Personally, I think you should. <laughs> um, my my question related to that versus like the senior center is, do you see issues in some sense, I guess it's more of a, an enrollment if you're offering similar programs to another department that isn't charging fees, you know, how, how does that sort of work? Or if they're not charging fees and you're trying to get something off the ground that 
you would charge fees for because recreation seems to be more of a fee-based department. Uh, how how does we, that affect your operations and choices you make to work with someone else or not type thing is sort I, of what I was trying to get at with that. Thank you, Maddie. That, 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 that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we actually have, like, we've had some stressful conversations uh, and inside of rec about our programming because we have butted our, butted our heads against that occasionally about outside programs that are going to try and do what we do and say, hey, we're just going to cut the cost and do it for free. And so what do we do with our programming here if if somebody that we've given access to in space and they've got space, maybe even town space, is now basically undercutting our programs? We've had that discussion about you know, we can't stop people from offering these opportunities, but we we do have to protect our programs that are run at a cost and we rely on them. It's even happened inside of our, our department where some of our pushes in outreach for say have been to try and make free programs. And when it starts to creep in, uh, it's not it's not one-to-one, -one, but if people that are looking for summer programs say, are looking for summer programs and and they see all of our our programs that charge and they want to send their kids to some opportunity they want to they want to give their kids an opportunity to be in and do something for the summertime and maybe i want to play a new sport maybe i want to try something new but if there are free opportunities that are similar enough then are we undercutting ourselves um, and so we have between our outreach and sports but, and certainly through our operations, we do have a series of conversations that are that basically are talking about promoting our, our, our the opportunities that we offer, but also we need to make sure that we are uh, that, 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 uh, that we're able to charge, that we're able to present opportunities that that people can go to if they aren't, you know, sometimes tennis camp is filled with tennis kids. Sometimes it's filled with kids that want to do something. And so we are trying to sell uh, possibilities. Um, I'll add to that also um, in that, like we are doing our best when we offer a program to, to really vet those who are actually instructing or coaching or what have you. Um, and so we're looking for real specialized folks who know their stuff. And so, you know, it's also trying to find that balance, right? Like, like we want to be able to get really skilled folks into, you know, lend their expertise in a specific area, but we also want to make it affordable. And so, um, so the formula we have come up with to make sure that we're able to, you know, get bring in talent but also afford to be able to offer it in Amherst um has has been better working out this year um than in previous years and I haven't seen so many things have to get like huge numbers like to meet a minimum it hasn't been so hard because we've come to sort of a better formula so I haven't seen many as many programs have to get canceled which was a huge concern for um for the public before that there were just things put out on the table and then kind of taken off the table um, at the last second. So that's been an improvement. Um, and then, yeah, I think Ray, one thing you started to say was regarding some of the outside organizations who, yes. who spend time in some of our town spaces. That's something that, um, you know, with the construction going on and we're gonna have to face that more um, in different school spaces and town spaces. So um, I think that's something we all want to look at, but we want to try to make sure like those prime hours and anything that, you know, towns, our town needs that we are prioritized um, in those spaces. So questions. Can I, um, Mandy was leading toward, she's asking on the revenue itemized list. If I, again, this is partially for you, but also if Holly's still here, if I turn to page 260 and I see revenues for recreation revolving fund and a total of 580,000, are those, does that capture the fee revenue from all these different fees? Um, you know, so Holly, you know, I, I asked about golf and golf isn't listed there. So no, it's separate. Yeah. It's so, so I, I don't know how to, I basically don't know how to read page 194, which 
shows the budget for the recreation department overall. And then it goes into the sub departments. And then at the end, there's something called recreation revolving fund and recreation revolving fund operating expenses, which gives us the pool and what does it cost to run some of these things. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to walk back and forth between those, mm -hmm. those pieces of information. Um, it's, it's just a, it's, and it's probably been in the budget book like this year after year after year, but I, I think so. was never yeah. thinking we would break. I've never thought we would break even on everything. I thought we would break even on some programs, you know, that we would price mm -hmm. it out to be able to run it, you know, um, but then on others, we're trying to make sure people have access to it. So we don't know how many people we, we said, well, you get the half, my kids did the soccer camp, the, this camp, the, that camp, um, or because their parents were both working, we needed to find camps and we just enrolled them in town camps. Um, mm -hmm. So so I don't know whether you can answer that question, but it's just a question I have on how we read the money that's coming in to you for the programs you're operating. So I'm trying to read that question. Um... While you get it, we, we did get a chance to take a look at that question and uh -huh. the, the chart, it's... Uh, I think specifically in the question, how is it reflected in operating expenses are nearly all the operating expenses, tuition assistance. Um, uh, it was when we talked, thank you for the question, because we actually, it is something we've been looking at every year here, but we haven't needed to explain it. And so it helps us, help me at least understand exactly how that's put in here. The, uh, 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 what was it, $157,000 in program subsidies, the percentage in that. I think it it does work out to be about a third, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that's what I remember seeing. You know, and I wasn't trying to get down to the yeah. this big level. It was just trying to understand since we, the budget book has the expenses and then somewhere else is, is the revenues. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and I don't, I don't, I see Mandy's looking at me, but I, I don't need to get this fully answered right I, now. Just be good I, for us to get an answer that we can present. Um, if this on. is a, yeah, Kathy, if this is the pie chart question, um, the question was kind of like, what is the, uh, the, the other operating expenses in our budget? That would be, I think the pie chart showed us our, our uh, staffing costs, the cost of staffing and it showed our subsidies and then the rest of it, the other expenses, that's essentially all of our, all of our uh, utilities. That's, that's, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the pr program supplies. That's our office supply, but which is that extra 3%, I, I believe it was on yeah, that I chart. Was, yeah. I wasn't doing the expenses side. I was doing the revenue side. So, but oh. yeah, yeah, you know, but, but as I said, it does. I don't need the answer right now. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not articulating. Well, there is this other page that shows downhill skiing, instructional classes, a whole bunch of operating revenue. So I'm just assuming that's money coming in, and it may be coming into the town and then coming back to you. So I, I just, it's the same way I asked. I jumped into the Cherry Hill Golf Course. I can see the operating expenses, but what? it's pretty busy these days. So how much are we bringing in? I, d I don't want to keep, I, I okay. see there now, Holly's got her hand up and three people have their hands up. So maybe I'll go to Holly first and then Alyssa and then Alicia. Okay. So I just want to quickly, I'm just going to answer the question quickly and I can certainly get you more information. So in the revolving funds, so the revolving funds are the sections that begin on page 253. It does show both revenues and expenditures on page 254 and then broken out into what are our three revolving funds. One is adult education, which has a very, very um, minimal level of activity. One is the after school revolving fund. And then the other is all of the other recreation revolving funds, everything from classes to summer camps, to sports camps, to the downhill skiing and all of that. There are revenues on page 260 and the expenditures on page 261. So those ones are 
broken out with both the revenues and the expenditure side. Um, the revenues that come into, and those again are the revolving funds and completely separate funds from the general fund. The ones that are in the general fund where you have rec outdoor pools in Cherry Hill, you'll see the expenses there, but the revenues per department are not broken out there on the general fund ones, if that just clarifies. And I can I can certainly get you more information um, in terms of the revenue that comes in from the pools, the revenue that comes into Cherry Hill, um, most all of the other revenue for recreation goes through the revolving funds. Thanks, Holly. So I'm gonna do Alicia, Matt, then Mandy. Um, thank you, Kathy. I was wondering if you could speak to um, budget capacity as it relates to residents who use external voucher payments for programs. Marion. Um, yeah, so we have we work with a couple different agencies for third party payments, and they're only accepted for child care programs, as you probably know. Um, and so that works for prime time, our after school program at Crocker Farm. And it also is applicable to summer camps, to our full day summer camps. Um, and so as far as prime time goes, they are licensed through the state. And so it's um, a, any state voucher that a family already has is very easy to apply to just a new provider, us being the new provider. And so that that works out. Uh, you know, we usually get at the end of a billing period is a month. And so at the end of each month, we'll get payment based on their attendance and how much the state voucher um, pays for for that student. And then sometimes third party payments don't completely cover the cost of the program. And so um, in that case, sometimes the family has a fee that they have to pay that they'd be responsible for. And then um, there could be some leftover um, that isn't covered by the state and that there is sometimes a gap that then um, has to manually then uh, be moved from fee subsidy. Um, and it works the same way for summer camp, but summer camp is a little bit more challenging because it's a totally different provider. And so, um, you know, it's, it's easy to work with UMass because they're, really quick about it. And they, they give um, UMass C-C-A-M-P-I-S is their acronym. Don't ask me what it stands for. Um, but they offer assistance to um, parents who are current UMass students, grad students or whatever. And so they pay a portion and then the family is responsible for a portion. And they are willing to help out with after school, but often we haven't had that it just hasn't come up that we've had a lot of UMass families that go to Crocker, maybe. Um, I'm not sure why they don't use that one, but more often we see Seven Hills. Um, and then Seven Hills for, for camp is, is something that we use, but it's a little bit more tricky because timing puts the, um, like we open registration back in February, right? Like parents are trying to make summer plans and what have you. And so oftentimes we don't know if we're approved by a voucher until May. And as a family, you don't know if you're approved by voucher until I think first week of June. And so oftentimes this, these funds come to us um, very slow rolling for camp. And so camp ends up being somewhat more subsidized um, by our own subsidy um, than those third party folks, cause it's just easier to get ours um, cause it's faster, right? We can approve it based on our criteria, which is using the FDA um, federal poverty guidelines. So I hope that answers what you were looking for, Alicia. Yeah, that was really helpful. I just have okay. two quick follow-ups to that. Yeah. Um, okay. So does the gap um, like create, like does that cause you all to limit the amount of vouchers that you're allowed to accept? It hasn't. It hasn't happened in the past couple of years. What we what we do for max enrollment, like let's say, let's say we're fully staffed and we can take seventy campers. What the public actually can see is that we're only taking sixty, 60 campers. You know, and so we are we are holding those slots 
for third party folks because we know that it takes forever to get an answer. Um, and so we we think that that helps with equity anyways. It's not a perfect system, but it helps anyway hold those spots um, for families who can who need more time to get their funds together. And then we can put everything through and guarantee the spot. So when when Marion says that it's not a perfect world, not a perfect system, theoretically, we could have that if we did have 10 spots that were being held. We don't for that tend week, to have that many, but yeah, we, I, I thought it was like five. But if, if we do have if we do have five, 10 slots that we're holding open there, then technically you could have 12 kids that are applying through third party that are fighting for those for those seats and so they're they're competing for limited resources that hasn't happened for us but um yeah. we haven't had that much uh, we haven't had that many that 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 came in for one week in the past we do save enough that that meets the amount of people that typically are applying but it could happen mm -hmm. that there's one week where there's an overflow mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. And just my last question is, is there a reason that all program doesn't accept other payment options? Um, I mean, we we have been approached by nonprofits before, which um, they can use their funds for whatever they want. Right. Um, and so we've had individually um, families come to us and say, hey, we were able to score this great um, opportunity with such and such an agency and they're going to give us like a, a d full dollar amount. They might say like, oh, they gave us $500 for the spring to do whatever. And so then they're using that. We also um, have families come to us through the school department too. Um, but it in that case, it's a little bit more on the families, I think. And so um, and we don't always know who the agencies are. So the ones that we've identified um, that we that we have a, a established working relationship with are the ones that I talked about. But there are other sort of smaller pockets of of money that people are finding. Thank you. You're welcome, M Matt. I think this question has been asked in a different way, but I'm just going to ask. <laughs> Um, simply just to, just so I understand, because I, we were, um, we were looking at Cherry Hill revenues, because one, one thing I, I looked at these areas last year, which turns out is kind of helpful, because then you remember the questions that you were going to, that you're going to follow up in the following year. Um, but there was a question about Cherry Hill and whether it, um, revenues are exceeding or covering expenses. And that was sort of, we hadn't seen the actuals yet. And I'm just curious how we yeah. did that. I have approximates, but I, I wonder if maybe Holly has some exacts. I, I think our revenues were a little over 300 and our expenses were just under a hundred. So we did, we did, uh, great. we did exceed. That's great. And then yeah. the, uh, the staffing issues that happened two years ago with the municipal pools, that's, that's all resolved. That was a mechanical thing that. Right? Yeah, that's, that's definitely. That didn't, that harsh. wasn't an issue for us last year. Um, and I know that we're doing, a, a much better job with, um, you know, we have, we have somebody who's got another year under their belt. And so I'm confident we're good to go there. Yeah. And, and so that, that was large part two years ago was mechanical. We also had to fix, uh, we had to fix our staffing issues and we have, I think we've made the last step this year, uh, this season preparing for to take care of it, it was taken care of on the, on the uh, lifeguard and instructor level, our our pool manager, our our pool management now is the last place. There we were, we weren't nearly as bad with overtime because of the mechanical issues. But then we also fixed the pieces that were that were managerial. Over the course of two years, we think we're we're set. Okay, great, thank you, Kathy. Just a quick time check. We're at three thirty-five. Okay, so I, I see Mandy has her hand up and Holly may be having her hand up to give us answers. So um, Mandy, do you want do you want to have Holly speak first or do you want to, what, what, how do you want to handle this? Holly yeah. can speak first because maybe she'll answer some of my clarifications. Okay. 
So you've got Holly, to, you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm muted again. Um, I was going to say, Mandy, you could go ahead. I was just trying to quickly run a couple of Cherry Hill numbers. So okay. I, um, just a, a quick calculation here. FY22, the revenue was 277000 Expenses were 244. I'm not sure what Mary had said. 300 and 100 that that did not sound right to me so 277 for revenues 244 for expenditures in fy 22 fy 23 we had 304,000 in revenue 242 in expenditure so the last couple of fiscal years it has run at a profit keeping in mind that employee benefits are not part of Cherry Hill. They are part of the general fund. So when you add in things like taxes and benefits and health insurance and, and the other employee benefits that folks get, that definitely changes the numbers. Um, and what was the, uh, there was another question now that I can't remember. <laughs> um, so Mandy, you could go ahead. Thank you, because I think part of my questions are following up. One of the things I was trying to do, which Kathy was also trying to do, when looking at the revolving fund versus looking at the expense side and those two different sections, I was trying to figure out how much of the recreation department expenses are not covered by fees received into the revolving fund. And that's one of the things I was trying to figure out. So one of my questions was... Um, you know, the the admin reimbursement that shows up as an expense in revolving fund, is that really similar to the enterprise fund transfers back for indirect costs that we see an enterprise fund send to a general revenue fund that sort of makes up for those indirect costs of pensions, benefits, health insurance, you know, managing the, the financial, you know, that, that finance side of giving the revenues and all of that. I think it would be very helpful for us to be able to, we get that with enterprise, right? All of these enterprise funds, we get truly, if it's run like a business, is it covering its full costs? Yet Cherry Hill pools and recreation in general, we never really see that. And I, I'd love to be able to see not just is Cherry Hill's fees covering its direct costs, but is it covering enough for those indirect costs as well as the capital that needs to be bought for Cherry Hill or to be bought for the pool. How are we doing that? I'm especially concerned with sports, youth sports because and youth programming in general, because there's a lot of, you know, uh, the director talked a little bit about this competing thing. There's a lot of nonprofits out there that really do break even on all of their expenses by charging fees for youth sports or youth programming. And I, I, including offering those fee subsidies to those that can't afford it. And I, I'm not sure we're doing that. And yet I can't ask those questions directly because it's hard to figure out whether we are or not and, and whether it's appropriate to be attempting to run the recreation department or portions of it similar to our water enterprise fund or our sewer enterprise fund and i think that's where a lot of my concern is that that could we turn these revolving funds into enterprise funds that might make it a little clearer would it be appropriate to turn them into enterprise funds and how can we be clear about how much taxpayer costs taxpayer property tax revenue essentially and and payments are going to pay for kids sports programs or an adult sports league, the sandlot leagues at the adult level. Um, what what are our taxpayers doing to support that? Um, and then we can have that real conversation about is that an appropriate level of taxpayer support versus offering a program that is paid for by fees. And, and let me just, um, so Mandy's getting at the big picture. I personally don't feel like it has to be run like a business, but it's more that we can't see to what extent, you know, so if total operating costs are $600,000 when we roll in benefits or $700,000 and fees come in at 600, we would know we're, we're providing something, particularly since we don't have a lot of summer programs that are available. So it, it's a question, I think, that goes beyond being answered today, Holly. And I think there's just a way that we, we'll pose the question 
and it will be, we can have a, a later conversation. I don't have any problem with the budget as we're seeing it. Um, it's, it's more a question of trying to understand the financing of it. Um, so, and, and I think you all don't see all the parts either. I mean, you don't have a, what Holly just quickly said, remember there's health insurance, remember there's a this, there's a that, you know, that's as soon as they're public staff, they come with the other pieces. So I think it's great that we're running programs with major subsidies in them to try to make them accessible to all um, and across all ages to really make that effort. So I, I don't think the implication is we'd like to know a dollar in, a dollar out kind of thing. It's just, we can't see it in, in what we're seeing with the data. So I see Alicia's hand is up and I know we're running way out of time. So Alicia, if you can ask or or comment really quickly so we can yeah. turn to Susan. Yeah, I just have one last question. Um, I know it's never ideal to use grant funding for operating funds, but is that something that has been explored in terms of being able to offer subsidies and other things, but still getting the full cost for programming needs? I have not, I can answer that. I have not explored it. Thank you. Okay, so I want to thank you both very much. We've sort of put you on the hot seat for when you look at what your programs are doing, you're serving a huge number of people. So on behalf of all those people, thank you very much. Um, and uh, to both of you and to your whole team. Thank and you I, very much. Thank you. And I, and I think we can... Uh, let you leave us and welcome Sue. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, y'all. All right. Hello, everybody. Switching gears now, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Sue, so, so the way we've been doing it, you don't, you can just say a word or two, but you receive some questions that people submitted so we can dive right into the questions that you were asked. Um, okay, great. Yeah, let's do that. I did write up something about what my biggest challenge is, but it may be a part of the question. So go ahead. Okay, did, uh, so, Athena, I'm assuming we sent, or do we not send any for clerk? There weren't any. Ah. Oh, oh. So this might be a quick one for us. <laughs> Well, why don't you catch up on time? Why don't you go into your biggest challenge, and then I have one or two. Yeah. Okay. Well, it won't be any surprise. It's going to be the uh, presidential election. Um, I typed up a little thing, so I'm going to read it because my thoughts are in order here. Um, so it'll be administering the presidential ec election, which we anticipate will be as challenging, if not more than, the 2020 presidential election because of our current political climate. So in 2020, just to give you a little history, um, of the 16,500 registered voters, 72% turned out to vote. Now this was COVID, so keep that in mind. Of those who voted, 76% did so by mail, resulting in the receipt of about 9,000 ballots, which necessitated the hiring of extra help for processing. On election day, instead of sending all these ballots to each polling location where the workers would have to find time in between voters to process them, we instead chose to set up a central tabulation facility manned by four teams of three workers. The teams worked from 10 in the morning until 10 at night to get the job done and also have some additional help from staff members. As we owned six spare tabulators at that time, we were able to use four of them for the processing of these ballots, but this left only two spares for all of the other polling locations. This was a risk that we were willing to take though, and luckily no tabulator failed at any polling location. Instead of using a central tabulation facility, the other option would be to deliver all of these ballots to the precincts on election day. Based on the turnout for the last few elections, I anticipate voters will be out in higher numbers on election day than in 2020 because it's non-COVID times and people are coming out in person to vote now. The election workers though, if we were to deliver all of these mail-in ballots to them, they would not have time to process them between voters based on the increased number of voters on election day. So what we're gonna be doing is something a little different this November. 
We're still anticipating the large number of mail-in ballots, but currently we only own four spare tabulators because as you all know, we purchased new tabulators and we only purchased four spares. So if we were to set up a central tabulation facility, we would have to rent tabulators um, since using our only spares would leave us with no spares and we can't, we can't do that. So our vendor has quoted a rental fee of $3,316 per, I see Holly's head popping up, per tabulator. I have not talked about this because that just seemed really high to me. So in an effort to save money, we're going to be utilizing a process called advanced removal and deposit. This is an option outlined under section 7K of chapter 115 of the Acts of 2020, which was put out for COVID purposes. And it allows municipalities to advance remove ballots from their mailing envelopes and then advance deposit these ballots into a tabulator. This is done the weeks before the election. Um, <clears throat> we used the advance removal process for the March 5th, 2024 presidential primary as a sort of dry run to get a feel for the process and to find ways to improve efficiencies. It worked really well. It saved election workers the time at the polling locations. And um, we just, it, it was a really good process. So we're gonna use the same process in November, but we're gonna take it a step further by advanced depositing the ballots into our spare tabulators in the weeks before the election. All ballots will be stored securely in a locked container in a locked room and totals from the tabulator memory cards that are being used for advanced deposit will only be added to the totals from election day at the close of polls. We'll hire a crew of election workers to run the advanced removal and deposit sessions. And so after all options were considered, after seeing the price for the tabulators, after deciding to do things this way, we felt that the comparison between using the cost, I mean, the, the comparison between the cost of using election workers compared to the cost of renting election equipment, it's like comparing the cost of a Toyota to a Lamborghini. So. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, <laughs> that's my biggest challenge, and I feel like we've found a way around it. Um, and otherwise, everything in my budget is pretty much the same year to year, with the exception of postage. Postage is always going up every time I turn around. Yeah, and Mandy, Joe, you have your hand up. Mandy, thank you for that explanation, because I've been curious how... I've heard different towns do early voting, early mail-in balloting differently. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that explanation. I have a question about that. And I presumably the costs of your plan are in this budget for the extra workers you'll have to do. Yeah. I've seen when, when the council's gotten early in-person voting, you know, when you split out the mail-in balloting, the early in-person, the day of balloting and all of that that early in person is not used a lot um and right. so could could some of that advance removal and deposit be done by the workers during that early in person voting time um to potentially save on costs or or to keep them busy during those times too similar to if they were doing it on election day at the polls can they be doing it that week ahead of time when it's open eight to five or whatever, and people are monitoring it there. Is that, is that sort of the time period you're looking at? Um, and, and does this, this, when you talk about election security, um, the, the ballot tab, the tabulating SIM card or whatever, the, the card that keeps what the tal ballot tabulations are ahead of time that can't be disclosed. Um, is that similar to, are you handling that the same way you would be handling all of those in early voting, in-person voting tabulations too? Yes, 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 good questions. So yeah, so for September, um, we are not gonna hire as, where'd you go? We are not gonna hire as many, <laughs> I know, you know, when you blank out, you move around. Um, we're not going to hire as many people for early voting. We're only gonna put two people on and that's it. So we're gonna pare down that way. Uh, what we have them do, though, you know, if we don't hire extra staff for our office and we run behind, um, we've been using them to help us sort ballots. Yeah, so they're being used. They're not just sitting there. It definitely. So, um, so no, I would not have them doing the advanced removal and advanced deposit process because it takes full concentration, basically. When we did it for primary, um, we came in on a Saturday. We had uh, six people. I was the seventh person and it took us, 
what do we have? Let me see, I've got my numbers. Um, last election. We only had two, about 2,000 mail-in ballots and it took seven of us four hours to process that. So judging by, you know, we had about 9,000 ballots in 2020. We had a little bit more um, registered voters though. So, but I'm gonna guess we're gonna have at least 7,000 ballots. So we're going to need, and we're gonna do it in multiple sessions, probably every couple of days. So we're going to need the staff to be focused just on what they're doing. It's a, there's a lot of requirements to the state and it's not something that they can just say, oh, I'm gonna you know, help out over here and do this. They're gonna need to focus. So, so that was the first question. The second one was, well, I've forgotten. What did you, <laughs> sorry, your last question. Just just confirming that the way you're planning on handling these nice. advance removal and deposit is the similar to how you handle the early voting, in-person yes. voting tabulations too, because they get tabulated at the early voting stage too. Right, that's right. So yeah, so we are purchasing um, bags basically that can be sealed and locked with a, with a zip tight, like a, a zip tight, what do you call them? Zip lock seals. And um, each day's there's there's set requirements in the state law that tell us that you have to do this that 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 so we're following the requirements but everything will be locked in a in a you know sealed in containers and locked in a stored room and that includes the tabulators um as we're doing sessions we're closing out the tabulator then we're reopening it with the current number so we're not zeroing out so that we're keeping a running balance you know ballots and sort of but everything is going to be following normal election protocols for security Thank you, Sue. Um, um, you know, one of the interesting things of the, uh, when you look at the services you provide is to see how many more notarizations you're doing. And, and I think it's a well-kept secret. We should, probably shouldn't keep that you still do that because we use we <laughs> use you a lot since, since the, especially since Hastings closed, they used to do it as well. Um, so the, you're, you're a busy year round department. Um, though elections are ex an ex on, on a whole nother level. So I want to thank you for your whole and your whole team because you are a pleasure to work with. Oh, thank you. And you're, thank you. <laughs> yeah. This has got to be the easiest budget hearing ever. <laughs> it's awfully quiet. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I think we're good. Um, unless right. it has any other closing. So we have, we have a few minutes left so you can you can leave us or you can stay as you um thank you sue okay you're, you're welcome thank you all i think i will go and get some more work done here all right so so matt you you may or may not have been at the council meeting last night but we had three financial orders referred to us a big one is track and field which has three parts so um i had a quick conversation with bob who had a conversation with athena so it was, and they're all, we're, we're due to report back to the council by the 17th of June, but we didn't have, we could schedule these for June 11th and potentially June 11th would be a focused piece. Make, correct me if I get this wrong, Athena, would be focused on track and field. And then the other was water and sewer rates and purchase of a property in, um, to, for, uh, to protect our water supply. So it might be able, we could work them into one of the other agendas, but so people should put a hold on June 11th if they didn't already have it on it for the regular two o'clock time slot. Yeah, Kathy, if I can jump in, yeah. if that's okay. Um, we also had the veteran services on the agenda. Matt had sent one question. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, Paul is able to respond to that question. If not, we can get the answer to, to that, Matt for you offline or at the next meeting, Paul? Yeah, I don't have an up-to-date answer for that one. We'll get that to you next time. So the upcoming agenda plan, Kathy, if I can reiterate what I had talked about with Bob, if that's okay, is that um, Bob is going to try and um, gather all of the budget report components from members prior to the 31st so that those can be put together and the committee can review those sections that are ready on that date um, as a preliminary review of the budget report. And then uh, the final review and recommendation would be the fourth 
I said the preliminary review, the 31st, just making sure I said the right date. And then on the fourth, finalize the budget recommendation, um, review the water and sewer rates, the optional tax exemptions, and then the water supply protection uh, property acquisition that Kathy mentioned. Um, and then we're holding the 11th for the track and fields uh, pieces. And there are multiple pieces of that that are all in the packet from the meeting last night, Matt. So if you're looking for information on any of those things, I can get those to you. They're in various council packets. Um, and then we wanted to ask the committee if they would please hold May, I'm sorry, June 14 as a possible date in case the committee isn't able to come to a recommendation on the track and fields project on the 11th so that the report can be finalized in time for the 17th. And then we would hold the public hearings on the 17th for the various pieces that need public, I'm sorry, public forums so that the council can act either on the 17th or the 24th of June. So that we can we can get that to everyone in writing so they don't have to quickly <laughs> scribble it down. But one, I'll do when that. I see both Mandy and Matt have, but one comment I just have on June 4th, we might need to post it as a, if we're trying to finalize a report and get it done and we're doing two other things, we might need to post it as more than a two hour meeting. So it's just a thought on that. Mandy. It, and that was part of the part of the idea here about uh, taking a first look at the report on the 31st was to, you know, so it's, you know, we're not going through line by line on the 4th, ideally. Um, but there will be a piece, the 31st, you're going to be looking at conservation, sustainability, planning and inspections. And I'm assuming the person who's writing those sections of the report won't have them written by that date, <laughs> um, unless you have a crystal ball with you. And in that case, then you can. But then we all need to get our, to the extent we have a section, so I have education, we need to, we need to get a draft to Bob. So M Mandy and then Matt. A couple of things I'm learning. I have to get a draft of what to Bob and what should it include. Well, it's, okay, it's my first time I mean, I covered the questions, but I didn't know that then that that included then writing some reports on stuff when we haven't voted recommendations. So that can be clarified some other time. But that maybe I'm not the only counselor committee member that's like what. Um, in terms of the budget, though. We've we've gone through stuff, but one of the big things that's missing from our schedule, I feel like, is we have a request to increase a budget from the school department, yet we've never as a committee talked about the possibilities for where that might come from as it relates to a recommendation with our actual finance team and Paul. And so I think that needs to be fit in somewhere in this budget before we can make a recommendation on the budget. And I don't, I, I think it needs fit in sometime next week if we're going to be talking about recommendations on Friday, time wise, um, or on the fourth, um, with potentially a longer meeting on the fourth, if we're trying to vote on the fourth, because we need to see those options or have a discussion about them. Similarly, Andy last night brought up about the track that one part of the referral relates to something that we might not even be able to act on because we don't have a request for a finance. Well, we don't have a proposed financial order or proposed request for appropriation from the town manager. Um, if the manager is waiting to see where the committee is leaning on a potential request, then I think we need to put that part of the track discussion before June 11th and uh, and all, um, because if there is an actual financial order, that order has to be attached to the um, to a public forum. Um, I don't think you can have a public forum without a financial order, essentially. Um, and so if we don't talk to the 11th and we don't get a, I, I, I don't think the timing works on that. So we might need to schedule sometime the week of the 4th, a preliminary discussion in finance on thoughts on that third part of the regional request. Because we again, it's similar to what we got into with the regional budget here, where we started talking before Paul made clear that's not he hasn't made a proposed budget yet um and so so those are my two concerns about scheduling next meetings and how we fit those things in in time to potentially 
fulfill the requirements of the charter and state law. So just, you know, uh, I, I went too quickly through things, Mandy, that what we have done in the past, and this year is a little different because we've got these two issues, but what we've done in the past is we've written up short paragraphs to uh, that get plunked in, and then there was a series of recommendations. But as you've identified, we've got one where if we have a discussion on fine, the, the regional school request to go to six, we need to hear from Paul on what are the options for where that money is coming from. Um, and then Matt, for you, if you didn't hear the track, one of the options needs another uh, $700,000. The other two options don't need any more money. They just need us to change some wording in a CPA allocation and the old free cash, some wording that would allow it to be flexible. So it's only if we go to the one that there would have to be a financial order. So there needs to be a discussion on, and the financial man, Paul and his team need to say, by the way, I don't know, I'm, I'll be neutral on this. There aren't very many ways we could come up with that amount of money, or he, he needs to make some statement so we know what level of world. So we don't have a slot Athena, in our schedule for those kinds of discussions where it's not bringing in outside people, it's bringing in Paul and his team. Um, and I see Andy's hand is up, is, so I'll stop there, but that's just, it does and th these are short paragraphs, Mandy, so it can be, you know, it's something you can't get from the budget book. You can refer to, say, the budget book, see the budget book, and during the, during the meeting, we got the additional amount of information, so it's very short and we can send you an example from last year. That's exactly what I was gonna say. I, I think using the, the report from last year is kind of an idea of what you're- I'll look up that report then. And just couldn't, if Athena or Bob or Kathy could confirm what people are writing, which sections there, yeah. Yeah. it would be helpful so, too. So, <laughs> so I've got education is the one I know. So, but yeah, no, so you, and you sent in some. So Andy. Yeah, no, I, uh... I think we had a discussion in the committee in prior years to just have a general understanding that we all worked out together regarding uh, what we were going to target in the way of content and estimated goal for length so that we were all together and all participating and could critique that process. And I was wondering if uh, you had discussed doing something like that with Bob or whether Bob was going to in turn um, give us a suggestion as a as another way to go about it. I'm not saying that our way was great. I just uh, think that some guidance, because otherwise we run into the problem of inconsistency. And yep. I think then you, that makes it harder to edit in the end to make it a consistent product and uh which will fall uh, uh because i did it for so many years and it's going to fall on bob this year bob should understand that um, if he doesn't give guidance in advance then as the editor in the end he's got a bigger burden for himself yeah um, so uh, i think you're right andy and we did it differently in year three than we did in year one because we got better at it. So, you know, in terms of the report, because in the first one, we had some sections that were two or three pages long and some that were two lines long. Um, so we'll, uh, uh, both Athena and I can talk to Bob when he's available to talk and do just what you've done. So it's the double request on who who does who do we think is writing a few pieces on each and, and not everything has to be written up and then we had a no more than this long um, and capture things that aren't in the budget book, but reference it that you're you're drawing people's attention to. So we'll we'll get that out as soon as possible. And and then because, in terms of the uh, the timing piece that Mandy brought up, that's a great point because we we really hadn't budgeted for that time. So um, I can either because we don't have ev everyone here, I would suggest that we see if we can convene the committee on the 7th and or the 14th. So we're, we're talking June, right? 
Yeah, that was my other question was whether, as you had said, June 14th earlier, whether you had a time that we were holding on our schedule. So any advance would help. We're doing 10 o'clock on Friday. So that's just a, I, I would suggest, you know, if, if uh, the members, if this is an okay time, that's an okay time for Fridays. So we talked about holding June, June 11th at two and June 14th at 10. June 11th at two is the normal um, committee meeting time, but then the 7th and the 14th, you've been meeting at 10 on Fridays. And so those so, are both holds in the calendar for slotting in these, we, we can't, some of it is linked to the report we have to write in terms right. of the budget. And some of it is linked to the track and field where we have to get back other items, yeah. So the budget report needs to be to the council by June 5th, 30 days after referral per charter. So we can't slot in a conversation about budget recommendations anytime later than June 5th under the charter. Right. So um, like I had, I had mentioned before that on the 4th, we would do water and sewer tax exemptions, the gauge property. So we could move those to the 7th. So you have more time for the discussion about the regional school. So what Andy's, Mandy's bringing up though, that if we have to get the report to the council by the 5th, if that is our deadline, having a discussion on if we, if we want, to, if we're going to recommend going to 6%, we have to have a, and how would we pay for it? And what are the conditions we would do to it? So we have to have that discussion earlier than June 4th, because we have to finalize the report. I mean, if it's, if the report's due on the 5th, there's not going to be any easy way other than having a blank section saying, and regional schools blank. Um, <laughs> So maybe we can't solve this right now and it's May 21st. So the we do not have a meeting this Friday um, at 10. And I don't know on regional schools whether there'd be any way to open up that discussion for an hour um, on potential sources. And uh, I'm just, and if, if it's with a 48 hour rule, this would have to be posted before 10 tomorrow morning to be, am I right? Um, no, before, by, yeah, we, you'll before 10 tomorrow. you know, so just looking at wh when we could have that focused discussion. Okay. Um, I think I need to talk to Paul and our finance team and figure out what we can do if we have information ready for Friday. And um, we can try and schedule either a meeting then or we'll look for a date next week. Okay. Paul? Mandy, am I right on what to... the deadline is? That dis that discussion has to be early enough that we can finalize the report on the 4th. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, I don't know whether we can fit it into Tuesday and Friday by asking less questions on either of those days <laughs> from DPW or conservation and development. I think those are what's basically left. Um, no, we you have, have, you have police. police. And we have yeah. police too. Um, um, and then it's conservation, sustainability planning, and inspections. So we were anticipating that would take the whole meeting on the 31st. I haven't received a lot of questions for those departments, so those might be more. If we could, what you said, if we could sh make that only an hour worth, and I, I'm not sure. Um, we just gave a lot of time to three smaller departments. Um, I mean, we, it was not, it was well used time, but um, so... I think we can't get any further without hearing back from you about trying to schedule this in. And between you and me, we can let Bob know about this, send information back on who's expected to do what and basic instructions, and then a copy of last year's committee report, you know, as a potential model, if we want to follow that model. Sure. Yeah. Last we'll year, follow, we'll follow up. Paul and um, Holly and I will follow up about what dates work for the regional school conversation. And we'll um, check in with members about availability for either Friday or next week. Okay, so one, I also need to remind everyone there's a hearing tonight at 6.30 and the finance committee is, we need a quorum of the finance committee. So we'll, we'll, I hope to see you all later. Um, and then if there are enough counselors 
there will it will be a joint meeting with the council and we'll call it to order and this is mainly listening um to people's view on the entire budget um, i guess so would you like me to make a brief presentation to kick off the meeting kathy yeah that's what athena said she was a, oh, you she, already talked about that no no yeah. she said she said I, you thought you were that's doing what we it. had planned yeah for yeah. Okay. a brief I just want to that's, confirm that's just perfect. a quick over now, answer today now that i became chair of it um what i was expected to do and she said well paul paul, paul will lead off with okay. a brief presentation okay. okay got it thanks and thank you i'm i'm sorry i was like catching up today um on a uh my style of chairing a meeting so thank you all for <laughs> the tolerance of the looser working but we will we will get all of this done and it's so exciting um, it's so <laughs> thank you all and i think um we can entertain a motion to adjourn so moved and uh does someone want to second it second okay then i will quickly go around the room andy yes kathy yes a yes mandy hi uh matt Support. Alicia. Yes. We are adjourned at 411, which is pretty good given how much we just covered. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.